So in this video, we're talking about Citizen Kane. Not whether it's the greatest movie of all time, because really, that's a useless question. I mean, even if you could really answer it, what would the answer do for you? Seriously, would there be a benefit to knowing what the greatest movie of all time is? You know, if you find out you love this or that particular movie, that's information that can change your life. <laughs> I just love it. You watch the movie, rewatch the movie. You look for other movies like it. Perhaps it even comes to influence the way you see the world. But if you find out X is the greatest movie of all time. Eh. Okay. At best, when people tell you Citizen Kane is the greatest movie of all time, it tells you that people have loved this movie. And maybe you could too. I do. And I'm not gonna try to convince you that you have to. I just wanna share a few things I find exciting about it. Because for me, the movie's a lot of fun. And maybe some of the things that excite me can also do something for you. But first, I want to complain. Because there's a few other things people say about Citizen Kane like it's the greatest movie of all time that helps suck the fun out of the movie. Like first, when they go on to explain that the reason it's the greatest movie of all time is all because of Rosebud. The smartest, most profound ending in movie history. Rosebud is, in my and Orson Welles' opinion, a little dumb. I'm ashamed of Rosebud, I think it's the... A rather tawdry device. It's the thing I like least in Kane, and it's uh, it was uh, it's kind of a dollar book but Freudian one... gag, you know. Really, the uh, big contribution of Mankiewicz was the Rosebud gimmick, which was his, not mine. I, and I'm still not too keen about it, but, uh, but it works. So I shouldn't be sour grapeish about yeah, it. Yeah, it works. It gives the movie an ending and provides it with what little plot it has. Good, Rosebud. Dead or alive. Citizen Kane wouldn't really be a movie without it, but at the same time, it's so contradictory with the rest of the movie's themes, which we'll talk about later, that Orson Welles felt the need to write the most awkward speech in the movie, apologizing for Rosebud just before it appears. If you could have found out what that Rosebud meant, I bet that would have explained everything. No, I don't think so. No. Mr. Kane was a man who got everything he wanted and then lost it. Maybe Rosebud was something he couldn't get or something he lost. Anyway, it wouldn't have explained anything. I don't think any word can explain a man's life. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, that's pretty corny. A missing piece. Though also somewhat necessary, as we'll see later. But let's move on to the second thing I want to complain about. Which is when people talk about the movie's influence to explain why it's great or why it sucks. Because both imply that the movie's really just a historical document, and you can't enjoy it as a movie, because every movie after Citizen Kane has learned to copy everything good about it, and now every movie is just Citizen Kane but better. There's a lot of problems here. Like if people could just take everything good about a movie and make it but better, we'd be living in a world where remakes were the best movies. I don't think that's the case. And it's not like every movie is just a redundant lesser copy of Citizen Kane, because just watch it, it's weird. <laughs> It's influential, but there's nothing else actually like it. Love it or hate it, you have to admit it offers you something no other movie does. Even if for you that just means a highly original form of torture. It is a torture you can't replace with any other one and one you don't easily forget. Alright, now here's the most annoying thing people say about Citizen Kane. Go on. Yeah, it's got great cinematography, but the movie's boring and I don't like it. Or in its most extreme and annoying form, it's got interesting camera angles, but it sucks. It's not the boring or sucks part that bothers me. Interesting camera angles. That's the worst phrase anybody uses when talking about any film. As in, this movie's really artsy and stylish because it has a lot of interesting camera angles. That's how people often measure the amount of style a film has, by the number of extreme angles and crazy camera moves. The form and style of a movie are really important to me, but camera angles are like the 50th thing I notice or care about. If you watch Citizen Kane and you only notice interesting camera work, you've missed a lot of the experience. Orson Welles called the film set the greatest electric train set a boy ever had because he played with everything on the set, not just the camera. Let's go to the opera. Here's the famous scene that takes us up and up into the rafters. It's interesting long before we've even started to fly. We have the acting of the overwhelmed Susan and the overwhelming opera coach. Watch all his crazy hand movement. There's the set which is taking form around her and the mini silly props which imply a ridiculous extravagance. We have the sound and choreography creating chaos and making a couple dozen extras feel like an army. 
Many of the extras take circuitous, even illogical paths which keep the fore, mid, and background busy, and take them at some point through center stage or point of focus in greatest chaos. I just like this guy jumping last second onto his lifted throne. Our focus was kept on center stage by the lights, which also kept the sides of the stage in darkness and the number of surrounding extras ambiguous. Feel free to rewind and try to count this blob of people, it's fewer than it looks. And now we see some camera work. But the camera can't do it all alone, it's gonna need some help if we really want it to fly. Now we have special effects. A miniature pretends to be more of the opera house, giving it an impossible size that somehow feels right. Notice the false screen wipe that helps hide the effect. And now the real one that takes us back to reality. Finally, we have a concise piece of pantomime that tells us everything we need to know about her performance. Watching this scene, we don't just see good camera work. Not just creative lighting or creative sound either. What we see is good creative filmmaking. And if we watched it again, we'd see even more we didn't notice the first 10 times. And on top of that, there's a lot more going on with this one scene than what we see in it. There's also the role this scene plays in the movie's editing and structure. We cut into it seamlessly. Then in one decisive swoop like a painter making a bird or cloud in a single brush stroke. We've experienced the building of the opera house, the opera's production, and opening night. All of that effort and distress and the spectacular failure it made. This one scene does so much and not just in terms of telling the story. I don't have a better way to say this, but it's all so magic. That's a silly word, but I mean something specific by it. One of the things I find most exciting about the movie. To help explain what I'm talking about, here's Roger Ebert. Now, this is a tiny paper mache statue, and then there is a wipe here that is invisible to take us from what appears to be a very big statue uh, down to a full size set. And once again, here, an example of the way that Wells is able to create an immense uh, feeling of wealth and luxury with very, very little that you actually see. The guard comes forward. And we've really uh, been showing almost nothing here. We've seen a door, a wall, a floor, a table, a chair, uh, three actors, and a paper mache statue that looks like it's enormous but is actually very small. And yet we've uh, had created for us the Walter Park uh, Thatcher Library, a, um, a space that seems very real and very convincing. Uh, even though it's made uh, really with smoke and mirrors. That's what I'm talking about. The movie makes you think you've seen more than you actually have, like a magic trick. Citizen Kane feels like an epic, like bigger than the cast of Thousand's three and a half hour long kind. But the movie's actually tiny. Whether it's the library made with just one light and a table, or Kane's political career, which is really just a guy standing in a car. This campaign with one purpose only. And this really big poster. The great edit between them does a lot of work. You feel the campaign between the two shots. Villainy of boss Jim W. Geddes' political machine. The giant audience is fake, by the way, just lights moving through little holes in a painting. For an even more interesting example, let's try to imagine Xanadu. World's largest private pleasure ground. It feels like a place, right? Like you can see it in your head. 100,000 trees, 20,000 tons of marble are the ingredients of Xanadu's mountain. But what have you actually seen? Let's start with the exteriors. We have matte paintings and miniatures, none of which offer us a clear, complete image. Xanadu is covered in smoke and shadow. Obscured behind something, and or is under construction and given to us in an incomplete state. We have pre-existing stock footage of a bunch of different places and many different architectural styles. They don't really fit together in a seamless or obvious way, but with these pieces given to us, our mind can't help itself. It forms a giant Frankenstein building. We have these three fences playing a similar role. And now for the interiors. Besides Susan's relatively small bedroom, we have just one fully built set, which ends up playing four different spaces. First, we see it as the big empty hallway it actually is, two doors, stairs, and this ridiculous fireplace. Next, it's redressed as a living room and enhanced with a matte painting to make it absurdly large. Then, we get the smaller hallway by dressing and utilizing the upper part of the stairs. And finally, it is the room of boxes once again given incredible size by brief revealing matte shots. We spend a lot of time in a few less existent hallways as well. There's the Hall of Mirrors, which is really a few of these movable three-pillared walls in this big painted backdrop. This one, which is the same wall and door, plus darkness. This one, two pillars and a back-projected distant beach. And this, which is completely a matte painting, reflection, and all. We've now seen most of Xanadu, a lot of it being hallways and stairs. Why? Because these things force us to imagine the even bigger spaces they must be there to connect. Like this window, which implies a big bedroom for Kane. Which is really just that window, a bed, and the same recycled door. 
we've now seen all the pieces of Xanadu minus one ingredient. A lot of boxes. But a lot fewer than it seems. There's about 200 boxes and they're being rearranged between every shot. First they fill our existing set, then between shots a whole new set is made by forming walls with the boxes. Notice the same movable wall. Then we see all the boxes in a pile and then finally arranged in a line. That's it. Xanadu! If we could redo the movie and actually build it or show a full CGI model from every angle, it wouldn't be better, it would be worse. If we can see an entire giant palace with our eyes and make out every detail, it's not a giant palace, it's something sitting on our coffee table. We can imagine so much more than we could ever actually see, you can't show someone a world, you can only suggest it. With the pieces of Xanadu the movie gives you, your brain builds something much bigger than money ever actually could. Because every bad painting has every leaf in the tree. And every great painting makes you see a tree. You don't want to show too much, but it's not about being minimalist. It's harder than either one. It's showing the right amount. 684,132! Knowing when to do this... ...and when to do this. There's no equation to give you the right amount, because often what feels right defies logic, scientific, or historical accuracy. Like our impossibly tall opera house. Or our impossibly tall Thatcher. He's standing on a box here, so he towers over young Kane. Or this. Uh, when you were making that sort of scene and making that sort of shot, did you ever feel nervous that maybe you'd gone too far? If I'd made that, I'd be, I'd be terrified that I was just on the point of toppling over into fast, that I'd made the room too large. Uh, did you have this sort of anxiety? No, because the room is that big. What room is that big? Awfully pompous answer, his room. <laughs> yes. Much more right than anything real. I hate to be uh, held down by what exists. The places, the events, Kane's life, we get just the right amount of each and no more. Huge places and events, and every one made out of smoke and mirrors. And the life of a person made out of two hours of smoke and mirrors. And we feel the weight of that life. After watching the movie, I feel like I've spent a second lifetime stalking Kane. All of its smoke, mirrors, and as we haven't mentioned enough, shadow which does more in this movie than just hide the size of the production, places, and things. It also helps the movie with its most interesting illusion. It helps hide Kane. Right, the whole movie alongside our faceless reporter, we the audience are also looking for the real Kane. It isn't enough to tell us what a man did. You've got to tell us who he was. What's the real truth about Charles Foster Kane? I wish you'd come to this theater when Citizen Kane plays here. And decide for yourself. And to our dismay, this isn't the kind of movie where the main character gets to give a speech, wrapping up all his motivations into a couple lines. We have to hunt for Kane, and like our faceless stand-in, we only have second-hand information. It's important we don't have a godlike omniscience because it means the movie has an even tighter control over what information it gives us. In some of Kane's defining moments, it doesn't even show us his face. Most notably when he signs the Declaration of Principles. You don't want to make any promises, Mr. Kane, you don't want to keep. These will be kept. Was he sincere or not? It's ambiguous and we don't even have the benefit of reading his expression, which is actually quite central to our event and our ability to judge Kane as a person. And it's exactly the kind of information we could never have trying to understand a dead guy we never met. There's a comparison I'd like to make here, but first, I really want to apologize for the example I'm about to use. If I'm not careful, this will become the most pretentious thing ever said. There's an artistic technique invented by Leonardo da Vinci, which happens to be most noticeable in, of all paintings, the Mona Lisa. Yeah, I know. But da Vinci put shadows in the corners of the Mona Lisa's eyes and mouth, because that meant her expression could be changeable depending on how you interpreted what was in those shadows. A lot depends on those little corners that can make it a sad smile or a happy one, make it seem sincere or forced. In a similar way, how we interpret this shadow in this small moment can completely change who we think Cain is. He can be idealistic, cynical, egomaniacal, or compassionate. We don't know, but that's not what it actually feels like. It feels like they're all there to some degree. This is another one of those situations where our mind can't help itself. We have too much information not to try to make something. And rather than the ambiguity feeling like a wall, it feels like an abyss. Our mind keeps trying to figure them out, but can never grasp onto anything. And along the way, we have a hundred interpretations that sort of fit, but not completely, and that gives the illusion of complexity. Kane seems to have a hundred motivations that even he doesn't really understand. Like an actual person. Jorge Luis Borges called him a labyrinth without a center. Wells' own description of Cain was a hollow man, and he said one of his ideas for playing the part was to deliberately distance himself from the character, especially in the older scenes. Even more emptiness disguising his depth. The enigma of it is Cain itself. Cain, Cain himself. You don't know him. You can't get to know him. 
but that doesn't stop the characters from trying to know him. Or the audience, or Orson Welles the filmmaker. The movie tries to use every filmmaking trick it can to try to reveal Kane and show him from every angle. And along with the magic, that's one of the things I find most fun about the movie. We have fake documentary, with real archival footage, and fake archival footage. Poetry, painting, animation, stop motion, puppetry, shadow puppetry, a lot of newspapers, and just for good measure, we even have a Kane musical number. We could pretty cleanly break up most of the movie into two drastically different styles of filmmaking, neither of which are unique to this movie, but are remarkable here for the way it mixes the two and takes both to their extremes. First, we have scenes where the filmmaking is almost invisible. These are usually done in a few very long takes. Rather than cut, the camera prefers to move. It kind of acts like a floating ghost eyeball that has a real presence in the scene even though the characters don't see it. This style puts us right there with the actors for the most dramatic moments in the movie. Sometimes rather than have the camera move, we're given one really complicated composition for the whole scene. This forces us to look around the room and discover information for ourselves, not necessarily in any set order. Which again puts us there in the room. It's immersive. But then, in complete contradiction to that, we have the film's other style. It's much more heavily edited montage scenes, no two of which are alike and all of which are very noticeable. They're not meant to be invisible. The filmmaker is grabbing you, sitting you down, and trying to give you a lot of information without being boring. Earlier, he was giving the actor space to act. Now it's his turn to try to be clever and amuse us. We also see this style in between scenes in the movie's many jarring transitions. Merry Christmas. And a happy new year! Which melds the movie's mixed bag of mediums and styles into a kind of vaudeville-like flow. It's like we have the filmmaker coming on again and again and announcing, Now for the next act. News on the mark! That one scene where you suddenly cut to a cockatoo screeching just before... That was to wake up the audience. <laughs> That's the entire that. significance of the cockatoo. For me, one of the most important qualities when watching a movie is being able to see on the screen that the filmmaker is having fun. A lot of the joy of Citizen Kane comes from empathizing with the filmmaker, Orson Welles, not its main character, which, as we've said, isn't really possible. Playful filmmaking is important in and of itself, but Citizen Kane's messing around with different styles and mediums does actually connect up with the movie's themes. Because after all the people in the story's best efforts, all of our best efforts, and all of art's best efforts, we still haven't been able to wrap Kane up in a bow. Because really, it's hopeless and a little perverse to try to completely investigate the soul of another person. If you try, they're always going to remain, like Kane, a little out of reach. It's not like you can explain somebody away with some convenient theory about their childhood or something. Oh, wait, never mind. Oh, Rosebud sucks. But luckily, it's not actually the ending of the movie. There's a much more satisfying ending that comes right after it. We return to the first shot of the film, and now it's become a message. To those who wish to investigate a man's soul. Speaking of not trespassing, I'd like to end this video by quickly investigating Orson Welles. There's a story about his childhood that I think could tell us a lot about Citizen Kane and his other movies. Seriously. It's from the epilogue to the authorized biography by Barbara Leeming. It's a story about something Orson called the magic box, and has something to do with the magic we were talking about in Citizen Kane. The story starts with Barbara the biographer visiting the Chicago Art Institute a place Orson would go to a lot as a kid. Orson told her when she went there, she had to see an exhibit called the Thorn Rooms. When she entered the exhibit, she found a lot of picture frames set low for children. In the picture frames were actually glass windows, and through the glass you could see fully furnished and highly detailed miniature rooms, the most interesting of which, she said, provided tantalizing hints of the imaginary spaces that adjoined them. Through a little window you could catch a glimpse of a fragmentary garden in the distance. Through a tiny double door, a patch of hallway was visible. Cutting ahead now. Did you see them? Yes, I saw them. Well, well, did you see it? What? It. I think so. Desperately fearing I had not. You did see it, didn't you? Orson continued. Now you understand. That's the magic box. I had heard him use that term before. Box. Your magic box. 
had heard him use that mysterious term to describe the artistic worlds he had created in films like Citizen Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons. These two he called his magic boxes. I don't know if that helps you at all or explains anything. But to me, that's exactly what an Orson Welles movie feels like. So if that makes any sense to you and you're into that sort of thing, I got great news. Citizen Kane is not his only movie. 